This is Dr. Charles Parker, and you're listening to Core Brain Journal. It's a place where I connect both fresh discoveries and interesting different perspectives from advanced mind science with the realities of real people and everyday life down on Main Street. Well, welcome, folks. Dr. Charles Parker here one more time for another interesting meeting with Core Brain Journal. And we've had a number of individuals here talking about DID, Dissociative Identity Disorder. We haven't had anybody come on and talk as carefully about EMDR as we're going to tonight. And uh, Farnsworth Lobenstein is going to join us. Thanks very much for joining us, Farnsworth. You're welcome. So he is a thought leader on the application of uh, EMDR regarding PTSD, regarding DID, and any kind of identity disorder and trauma and and really pulling oneself back together from what seems like an untreatable situation. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Before we begin, uh, I want to mention that Core Brain Journal is supported by a, a number of interesting people, including Direct Health Access Laboratory with over 3 million studies. They are deep leaders of experience with the big picture of measuring the molecular advantages one can attain through methylation, cryptopyrrole and copper challenges. You know, the brain science is amazing. They have a global service with a molecular focus. See more laboratory details at dhalab.com forward slash core. These are impediments in the way and they're measurable. Then Core Brain Journal is also supported by another very interesting group, the nonprofit Barry Robinson Center teams in Norfolk, Virginia where they address the complexity of adolescent treatment failure nationally and internationally. And for 80 years, they've been doing it. They provide residential care for children and adolescents on an evolved family, interpersonal, and global level. Check out their innovative and comprehensive programs at barryrobinson.org forward slash core. And that's B-A-R-R-Y Robinson.org forward slash core. So with that, let me introduce you to Farnsworth. He is a clinical social worker living in Massachusetts. He's an approved consultant for the EMDR International Association. EMDR is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy. It's one of the three therapies approved internationally for the treatment of PTSD. Because it treats the body-mind and not just the thinking brain, that is the focus currently of talk therapy. It's also proven to be very useful in the treatment of depression, anxiety, and many other refractory psychological disorders. It's been proven to be effective treatment for complex trauma and the dissociative disorders when it's appropriately <laughs> modified for that that's, uh, symptoms uh, group. He trained in EMDR in 1999 and has been on the national faculty of the EMDR Institute since 2001. So he brings years of experience. So let's go ahead and introduce Farnsworth. Farnsworth, how in the heck did you get interested in this complex issue of the application of EMDR to these very difficult and sometimes frequently misunderstood uh, conditions? Well, it's a long journey. I went to graduate school in 1967 at Columbia University, but I was a community organizer and I hated psychiatry because it seemed to me like psychiatry hated people. They only had negative definitions of people. And I worked as a community organizer and a medical social worker and a school social worker for many years. But in the 80s, brief therapy, began developing very positive approaches to clinical work where the understanding was that everybody has the solutions within them. And so I was getting really bored being a school social worker in New York City. And as my son graduated from high school, we planned to move up to Massachusetts. And I knew that I was ready to become a full-time clinical social worker, and that's what I did. And I trained in several therapies in the 90s, um, but in 1999, 
I read about and jumped into my training in EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy. It's a very cumbersome name for a very brilliant understanding of the body-mind. And as I did that training, EMDR is at the cutting edge of the psychological field. And so it invites attention to complex trauma. It teaches the elements of dissociation. And so over many years, I became more and more interested and fascinated by that work. And I would say that in the last five years, my work has focused primarily on working with clients with very complex trauma and dissociative disorders. So that's great. Now, you know, one of the things I really appreciated uh, as we were beginning to prepare a little bit and just getting to know each other before we started recording was the, the, the concept of the kind of ordinary individual can have these separate and distinct personalities without necessarily being fully dissociated. And that if a person could kind of walk into this discussion from, if you will, the normality of it, that might take them to a better understanding of what you deal with every day. Could you elaborate on that, that conversation we had a little bit, please? Sure. So we all played many different roles from myself. I'm a therapist, but I'm also a husband. I'm also a father and a grandfather. I'm an avid gardener. I used to sing in choral groups. I'm a friend. And I'm using different parts of my brain in those different roles. If a doctor or a nurse or an executive, having had a very busy day, comes home and gets down on the rug and plays with their one or two-year-old child or grandchild, they're suddenly in a different world. They're no longer thinking clinically or making executive decisions. They're going goo goo gaga and making the baby laugh. <laughs> and so they're switching into another part when we are in bed with our spouse or lover and we're talking about challenging issues or we're making love. We're using different parts of our brain than if we're chopping wood for the fireplace or the stove or if we're driving through a frightening storm or if we're at work doing the work that we do at work. So we all have these different parts of our personality and normally they complement each other and fit well. So I can have a friend who is a teacher like myself in the MDR world, but for 25 years he's been part of a older men's baseball club that plays in an older over 30 baseball league here in Amherst, Massachusetts. And clearly that's a whole different set of skills and friendship bonds than when he's seeing clients or teaching a workshop. However, when people grow up under great stress, um, then they often have much more segmented personalities. Someone, like some of my clients, grew up understanding that it was dangerous to ask for anything because a mentally ill parent or an alcoholic parent or a drug addicted parent had no patience and couldn't see the child as a separate human being. And so the child learned to be invisible as a survival technique. Um, when they got older, they didn't know who they were. They didn't have a sense of self. And so they were easily bullied or easily taken advantage of. And if that neglect extended to significant abuse, then the child might have often left their body to not be hurt by the physical or sexual abuse that was being done to them. And that part kept the knowledge of what was being done to them, and they may not have remembered it. 
Miss America 1984 um, wrote a book, Day Child and Night Child. I'll remember her name in a minute. And she was the victim of more than a decade of incest by her father, and she wrote the story after his death. And he would come and molest her at night, and then he would sit across from her at the breakfast table, and she had to act like everything was completely normal and he was a nice daddy. And then, of course, she was expected to go get straight A's in school. And she had to do everything possible to make sure that the day child and the night child never connected. I worked with one woman who was molested by her older six year older brother for a number of years. And even as a young teenager, she had no memory of it. And she loved hanging out on the back porch with. She'd be 13 and they'd be 18 and 19, him and his friends, and she was just hanging on for attention. And when she had a, a vaginal delivery of her only child, she started having memories of what had happened to her. And when she then had some clearer memories, first it was dreams and then memories, and she told her family, her family was indeed supportive, and exiled this brother from the family. 30 years later, he had the deed to his mother's house and had to be brought back into the family for some issue of repairs. Um, and this woman ended up in my office. Um, and it made me wonder, one of the great things that she taught me, because our clients are our greatest teachers, is how often when women have postpartum depression, most of the time it's straight hormonal adjustments. But sometimes, in fact, the postpartum depression is that something is being shaken up from King Tut's tomb and is leaking out from things that were done to her as a child. Um, so, Dissociation ranges from totally normal, missing an exit on the highway or not hearing someone call us when we're engrossed in a book or a movie or a football game, to occasionally feeling strange, to sometimes being really smart at math and sometimes not remembering that they're smart at math, to sometimes behaving in ways that friends and family don't recognize, um, to really having very separate identities and being greeted by people on the street, by people you don't know calling you a different name, which is of course a very extreme form of dissociation, dissociative identity disorder. Those are some of the characteristics that sometimes happen with people with DID but I've treated a number of people who, because of severe abuse, developed dissociative identity disorder. And I think I should pause occasionally to let you ask me a question. Because <laughs> I, I was, can talk and talk. <laughs> no, that was great. I was actually getting right to, I, I wanted to make sure you finish that thought because I was thinking about the same thing. I was thinking a point of clarification just to uh, pull together a little bit what you were talking about is, so that individuals have different personalities and with trauma, those personalities can be uh, destructively separated. Exactly. And so, that, and so that what happens in that destruction, these personalities then form a life of their own defensively because they can't really communicate with the entire reality because the entire reality is too terrifying on some level. Even if it's post-traumatic, any association with the past brings the past back so dramatically that they have to be disassociated from the past and broken up in their personality in regards to whatever the subject is uh, that, that was troublesome for them. Is that right? Very well put. I remember years before I was a clinical social worker, I met a woman and got to talking with her. And during World War II, she had been hidden in the woods in the forest in Poland to escape the Nazis. 
and she told me that in New York City, whenever there was a cold, rainy day in the fall, she was just completely frightened and couldn't, had great difficulty leaving her home because suddenly she was that five or six year old girl back in the forest. And hers was a social, socially imposed from fear of the Nazis, not that she wasn't cared for and loved by family and friends, but it was that situation brought that back. So then what you're saying, and, and, and clarify this for me, because this is obviously your area of expertise, not mine, but it really, I think to really talk further about it with uh, the listeners, is individuals can come in who may not have any consciousness of being traumatized, but feel that they're kind of at war with themselves. In other words, they may not have a formal dissociative identity disorder, but they can be at war with themselves internally because they're trying to cope with something. And that measure of denial and, and separation from reality then can throw them into a perpetual uh, underlying sort of unconsciously driven anxiety state that's, that's just eating away at them for years. Yes, that's exactly true. And, but you can also extend it to addictions and eating disorders Someone who is an alcoholic has a part of the personality that absolutely wants to be well and struggles to get well and has other parts of his personality that just want the bottle and constantly undermine the attempts to achieve health. And um, people may have grown up in dysfunctional families where there was a message that you're stupid and you'll never amount to anything. And yet there were teachers who clearly saw that you had a lot to give and that you were actually quite smart. And so you might develop a great deal of confidence in science from your science teachers and yet socially be convinced that you're stupid um, or still not be able to read easily because that's where you got undermined and attacked. Um, the Kaiser company that is the largest um, provider of healthcare in California did a study over 25 years with 17,000 adult patients. And they asked them seven, 10 different questions um, at the time of their annual physical. And they're very simple things. Was there fighting in your home? Were you threatened? Was a parent hit or beaten frequently? Did anyone five years or more older than you sexually abuse you? Was there a, did your parents divorce? Was a parent in jail? Things that most of us experience some of those. And they determined 25 years later, following these people, that if you had four or more of those, you were likely, almost definitely, have at least one of 25 different medical diseases that shortens lifespans, like, um, heart conditions, diabetes, kidney illness. So childhood, adverse childhood experiences scale, you can Google it, um, literally causes life-shortening illnesses. And because it's so destructive to experience those in childhood. So that's interesting because... What you're talking about is shed some new light on, on something that I had really never considered quite as thoroughly. I mean, I had a sort of a little pre-conscious thought about it, but really what, what we're saying is, because we have people that practice with us that do EMDR, but I really didn't think about this point, and that is almost every EMDR treatment from what I think you're saying has a measure of undoing the... Uh, 
separation, it almost is a dissociative experience. And in order to overcome the PTSD through EMDR, there is a measure of uh, integration that takes place. Yes. EMDR is an associative process. And say you were in a car accident at 16 and so you don't drive. So if we can go back to that memory, having established a relationship with a client and their ability to change states by imagining that they're at the beach and smelling the salty air and hearing the waves, like a safe place, for example, we want to light up the neural pathways in the brain that experience that accident by thinking in the human brain, the prefrontal cortex, the image, and in the emotional brain, the middle of the brain, the limbic system, the emotions that, excuse me, the image and the negative and positive belief about that experience now, I'm not safe, and then the limbic system, the mammalian brain, the emotions, and then the brainstem, the reptilian brain, the body sensations associated with it. The person might immediately shiver or shake. And we light up those pathways and we are able to take the current experience of that long ago experience and process it to re resolution so that they realize that they certainly are safe in the present. All things are relative, but and that they've had many experiences in cars since then where nobody got hurt. And they have strong motivation to start driving because now their son or daughter is away at college an hour away and they want to visit them. And they have lots of competence at work and in life in general. And so they can bring that present sense of competence to that memory and unravel it and associate what happened then to the current sense of competency and experience and appropriately, gently learn to drive again. So then there's a connection between the reptilian mammalian and prefrontal cortex. So it, there's a synchronicity that develops that didn't pre-exist based on the trauma. Right, because traumas that are not handled well get buried in the timeless right brain, and we really have two brains, a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere, but trauma that's not resolved at the time gets stored in the timeless right brain with those the, what the experience was what's like then. The screech, the crash, the fire engines and the ambulance noises, seeing, you know, your bloody hand, whatever happened. Um, and that gets reassociated to present reality and present knowledge. And after several sessions, the person is usually able to begin driving again. So Farnsworth, you do some teaching as well. You train others how to do EMDR. And I'm going to ask you a question in a minute. We're going to take a break here for a little sponsor recognition, but, uh, you, the, the question that I want to ask you in a moment is, in your teaching of other therapists, what is one of the most important uh, landmarks that that therapist in their evolution has to cross to make the big step that it takes to draw uh, severely dissociated individuals back together? It seems to me that that is a, a particularly unusual challenge. Uh, that would be uh, sort of the nadir of the whole thing. It's like it's so, so complex and so troubling. So the question I'm going to ask you, I said a little too wordy, but, you know, what do you, what do you think is the challenge for a person coming into that who has to treat it? Uh, what, what's the challenge that they have on a personal level to transform themselves so that they can? And we'll, we'll be back in just a moment to ask that question. Well, folks, you know as well as I do that Psychiatric treatment failure, especially after multiple medication trials and those very, very brief hospitalizations, may prove insufficient to deal at home with the complexity of troubled children and, and those adolescents from 6 to 17 years old. Improved care, those next mandatory steps, 
should include a more comprehensive approach to address those multiple levels of challenges, from family to peers to school, diagnostically from defiance to depression, on every level for families, including military families, internationally. The Barry Robinson Center's 32-acre open college-like campus in Norfolk, Virginia, provides safety and security and clean, comfortable living how do we know we refer folks over there all the time, strongly endorse what they're doing? So for further information and informed interview, connect at this page, barryrobinson.org forward slash core. Well, you folks already know that here at Core Brain Journal, we're on a mission to introduce you to resources that make significant contributions to the investigation of those predictable mind science applications. Our colleagues at DHA Lab Group provide a real difference with treatment options for people at every level, from first awareness of mind problems to those frustrating times when even well-informed treatment becomes surprisingly unpredictable. For my entire professional life, from psychoanalysis to brain scans, I've searched for, yes, improved predictability. The good news for all of us, from professionals to patients, remarkably effective research offers useful cost-effective, organic options far beyond guesswork with psychiatric medications alone. DHA lab tests measure unbalanced biomedical details through easily available testing, now available globally for a variety of molecular answers from, for example, methylation, copper, and cryptopyrrole challenges. Check in for more details at dhalab.com core. That's D H A L A B dot com forward slash core. So, Farnsworth, I'm so sorry to be so wordy in that question, but I was thinking about how useful this conversation is. And I know individuals who would like to have some EMDR training who themselves might want to do something, but would. It's going to be an answer for the, for the listener as well as the therapist out there. Uh, what does a person, what does the therapist do and what does the individual do when they actually start that process? That is the transformational moment. How do you accomplish that? What do you do to, to make that happen? Well, I would humbly suggest that there are countless transformational moments and I'm often moved to tears by those small miracles in my office. I was working with a volunteer at one of my recent workshops and practicing the conference room, which is a place where we can work with parts of the personality, co-conscious or not. And she was in touch with a child part of herself that felt very, very isolated. And her adult self was able to say, tearfully, there is irrefutable proof that that child, that part of me, was indeed never, never alone. The people that she wanted to have present may not have been present, but there were always people, teachers, ministers, neighbors, who were there for that child. And her sense of isolation was can now be shifted so she can know that she was never alone. And part of this process of working with complex trauma, clients with complex trauma, is really appreciating that different age parts of the person, there is one person, there is one body, but there are varying degrees of differentiation and co-consciousness that there's an invitation for the adult client to be able to look at child or adolescent parts of themselves who were very lonely, whose grandmother just died, whose mother was hit in a car accident and is in the hospital and she's living with an aunt and uncle who don't really have patience for her because they already have six kids in the house. Just normal life events can cause children at different ages to feel very isolated. 
And if the adult has a capacity to look with loving eyes at that child part, then there's a reunification and the child part can realize it no longer feels alone. One of the hallmarks of working with dissociation is that slower is faster and that we have to move very slowly because very often clients with significant dissociation are doctors and nurses and elementary school teachers and all kinds of other things, other professions. And they need to be able to go to work and know that this work is going to be done carefully outside of their awareness. Because if all of a sudden, um, if in the middle of the Miss America 1984 pageant, Marilyn Van Derber had all of her horrific abuse come up, she would have collapsed in the middle of one of her performances and never won the title. She had to keep it very separated until it could be worked on in very careful ways. Um, so this process of healing takes a great deal of very careful procedure. Maybe you can make the analogy to open heart surgery that has to be done with 150 separate specific steps or something. Mm -hmm. Well, one quick question there. Uh, that integration point that you drew, um, it sounds like there's an issue, and I think the word co-conscious is an important word for us to elaborate on because uh, before there's co-conscious, the, the whole situation is relatively unconscious. Then there's a co-consciousness that occurs. It seems like the co-consciousness from what you're saying, and again, I'm not an expert in this by any means, the co-consciousness is, is a step to actually recognizing that other part, that other piece, that other trauma, and that EMDR helps bring that other piece into a full consciousness under which the co-consciousness is a step in the direction of, of actually mastering and dealing with. It. Is that correct? Yes, and of eventual integration. Generally speaking, the goal with working with people with severe dissociation is integration so that they are present 24-7 and can function in their lives as workers and parents and spouses. And often, adult children taking care of the parent who abused them, who's now very old and infirm, I did work with one client with DID who was very clear that she had no interest in integrating. She said, I feel sorry for you normals. You have to be on 24 seven. I can check out anytime I need to when I get overwhelmed. <laughs> so it is a slow, gentle process. And one thing else that I might say about this process of being the therapist working in that situation is that these clients live in a considerable degree of a dissociative fog and they are often lost in space and time and feel present one minute and suddenly the smell of a perfume or the sound of the telephone or something sends them back into childhood and they suddenly might be frightened and that dissociative fog is present in our room with them so we are often need to be attuned to the fact that we get lost in that dissociative fog too. And for example, sometimes it can be very helpful for the therapist to say, my stomach is feeling really churning right now. I'm wondering if that's something that you're feeling too. So that if we can be attuned to the sensations that they might not be, they become they learn to be aware of their body again and to connect with it. And that's an important step in their healing. Great. Now here's a, here's a tough question. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but uh, you know, it, it, I'm sure you have some kind of an answer for it, but it sounds so complex to me, but how does the EMDR activity actually facilitate the evolution of that co-consciousness? Because that sort of ties this whole conversation up into a, a, a neater bow. I mean, it got a little more of a, a coalescence of information if we can understand 
that connection between EMDR and co-consciousness and integration? Well, EMDR is an associative therapy. And when we're working, whether, you know, a perfectly well-functioning person who just can't drive because of a life-threatening car accident at 16, or someone who experienced horrific abuse or torture or whatever that has dissociative identity disorder, in both cases, we are bringing the present and the past together so that there is increasing awareness that what happened in the past is no longer happening. And that's a point with my complex trauma and dissociative clients that we experience a hundred or a thousand times over and over with the same child part and with many different parts of different ages. So it is an associative process. We can only do EMDR focusing on the past if the client can keep one foot in the present and one foot in the past. So we provide some form of bilateral stimulation for say 20 or 30 seconds. And then we say, take a deep breath and let it go. What do you get now? And we want to make sure that they're in our office feeling the couch underneath them when we say, what do you get now? Looking back at the past. And as these, in many cases, in my client caseload, as these child parts realize that they grew up to be an adult, as the adult can look with compassion and loving eyes, as one would normally look at your own biological child, or your niece or nephew, at these child parts, then the child parts can be rescued from the past and brought into the present and realize that they are now safe. And that's work that I do every day with my clients. That is so interesting. It really is. It sounds, it, uh, it sounds so, so interesting to actually see it happen and to, to uh, actually facilitate that. So let's talk a little bit in closing, you know, we're winding a little bit out of time. I just enjoy this conversation so much. He's, you know, you get into the depth of the conversation. It's like, oh, by the way, we got to leave. I mean, <laughs> you know, it just doesn't, you know, it's not, the same a, way. it's not a natural consequence of the conversation. You know, uh, it's like, how do we work this out and hang out a little bit more? I mean, that would be where I'm going with it. But uh, me too. So the issue would be, let's, let's do bring it a little more to a close. First of all, do you have any parting thoughts about how the uh, audience, the listening audience can connect with you for further information about what you do for training and that sort of thing? If you want to drop that out, that would be helpful. Sure. So if you Google my name, Farnsworth Lobenstein, L-O-B-E-N-S-T-I-N-E, -E, you'll immediately get the first three things that pop up will be my website, which I share with a colleague, George Abbott. And you can read more about who I am and the work that I do and a description of the teaching that I do, um, year-long seminars for EMDR trained clinicians and two and three day workshops for EMDR trained clinicians on complex trauma and dissociation. And um, if you successfully dig around there, you'll also be able to read some comments of the experience of former clients and how this really transformed their lives and not necessarily people with dissociative disorders, but how powerfully healing EMDR therapy can be. You can also go to EMDRIA, the EMDR International Association.org, EMDRIA.org, or EMDR.com, EMDR Institute that does most of the training. And there you can find out a wealth of information about what EMDR is and how it works and studies about treating trauma. If you're a professional or interested, you can access our journal, the Journal of EMDR Practice and Research through one of MedPub or something. Mm -hmm. um, and 
you can also Google EMDR therapy and get a lot of links. There's a number of websites, organizations that um, have a lot of information that share transcripts. Some of them share live website, website show live videos of actual EMDR sessions um, and how they were transformative. So that's great. Let me ask you this question. Do you work with people, I can't imagine, but perhaps you do, do you work with people virtually with this or do they need to come to Amherst? How does all that work? Um, I do not do EMDR virtually. Um, I think it's important that there are people in the same room. There are people who do EMDR therapy virtually. Um, I do a lot of consultation with EMDR trained clinicians virtually on HIPAA compliant websites. Um, well, that's but, a good, yeah. Well, that's a step in the direction. I just wondered how people could connect with you because it's, uh, you know, there's a complexity, right. it's over time and, and, uh, and you know, I currently have no openings in my practice for clients, even the ones who live locally. I'm very busy with a lot of my teaching. I tend to focus on teaching Mondays and Fridays and seeing clients Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Oh, yeah, great. Well, thank you very much. You know, I just love your first name. I told you this privately. I think Farnsworth is such a great name. It's so memorable. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate you coming on. I mean, you've said so many interesting things. And Farnsworth kind of typifies what a unique individual you are in terms of the way you approach the material and think deeply about things. It's, it's got a different, uh, it's, it, it, even in the name itself, it's a, it's a different wrinkle, and I really appreciate it. Well, I have to say very briefly that I got my mother's mother's maiden name, and my twin brother Clark got my father's mother's maiden name. <laughs> and I named my children David and Kate, because they weren't <laughs> going to go through all this ridiculous <laughs> misunderstandings and misspellings that I've gone through all of my life. So it's been big, a pleasure, uh, Chuck. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Farnsworth. Great talking to you, and we'll do it again sometime. That'd be lovely. Take care. You too, buddy. Thanks for listening to Core Brain Journal. We're working every day behind the scenes to bring you reports that connect research benches with those street trenches. Here we share the complexity of mind science because, as you know, details really do matter. One of the most pervasive misunderstood challenges is how commonplace medications like those written for ADHD are used so regularly without clear guidelines. If you think you'd like more specifics, take a minute to download my two-page PDF packed with video links and references on the absolute essentials of how to start ADHD medications. They're easily available at corebrainjournal.com forward slash start. Thanks for listening. Do connect and stay tuned. Together we can make a difference.